everybody. Welcome back to Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Tuesday, June 21st of 2022. Thank you for tuning into the stream here today. If it's your first time watching or listening to this show, my name's Jordan. I'm the head coach here at Saber Sim. Uh, and Office Hours is an open Q&A style show where I answer questions from the Saber Sim community about how to use Saber Sim to build better DFS lineups. If you have questions you would like me to tackle on this show, uh, there's a few ways you can get them answered here. You can email us, support at sabersim.com. You can post your questions live in YouTube chat if you're joining me live here today. Welcome uh, to the live crew here. And you can post your questions in the Office Hours channel in Slack. I typically start uh, with those Slack questions first. So I think that's probably the best way to get your questions answered here on this show. If by chance you are not in our Slack community yet, uh, it's free to join. There's a link to join in the description of every past show. And it's great. There's the Office Hours channel that I just mentioned. There are the Sim Alerts channels letting you know when we run new simulations for games, when news breaks. Uh, and there are the other general sport channels where there is... Uh, awesome conversation going on pretty much every single day in those channels. We've got a lot of very uh, sharp, sharp names uh, and minds in the DFS space in those channels talking through strategy every single day. So uh, a really good resource there. I can't I can't preach uh, how useful that Slack community is enough. So uh, we have a couple questions in our queue here for today. I see a couple questions about uh, some FanDuel contest selection, mostly based off of our new contest selection framework that we've been talking about here the last couple of weeks. Uh, I see a couple questions about general, or at least one question about general golf strategy or my golf strategy. Talk a little bit about that here as well. Um, I think that's it in terms of what I'm seeing right now. It might be what I missed. We'll get to everything though here uh, in just a moment. But as always, uh, if you have questions for me, fire away at me in any of those three channels here. As we get going, I suppose don't say if you want a question answered on this show, maybe not a good time to send an email into support. Uh, but if you're watching live here, uh, you can go ahead and post your questions into the live channels and we'll we'll get to them here in just a moment. So uh, before we do that, I did want to just kind of get started. If you watched or listened uh, to yesterday's show towards the tail end of that show, we were. Uh, kind of chasing down a, a bit of a strange bug uh, as a group here uh, related to editing custom projections and just seeing a little bit of weird behavior overall where, you know, I think we we took down Garrett Cole's projection, which probably wouldn't have worked out so well if you did that anyway last night. Uh, but we took down Cole's projection and we were still getting a lot of him and just, just a little bit of weirdness overall there. Um, we resolved that overnight. Uh, Matt worked pretty hard on getting most of those issues resolved here. Uh, all of that should be um, fixed now. I don't want to spend too much time talking about what was an issue that is now mostly fixed. So, But I did just want to give a bit of follow-up to anybody that was watching yesterday, that's watching here again today. Um, that, 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 should be, that should be working as intended here now. So uh, big shout-out to Matt for jumping on that and getting all that resolved there. Um, and a shout-out to Guy Will Gamble and um, who else? Uh, there was somebody else that had reached out, Wear and Tear, who had reached out to me a little bit later, providing a little bit more background to help us uh, fix that and, and resolve that. So um, anyway, with that said, let's go ahead and dive in here and let's get uh, some things going on here. Um, so I'm going to start with this here. We'll bounce around again. Um, this was from Phantom and it looked like echoed by uh, Mr. Toasted Taters here. Um, and I, I'm going to start here uh, on FanDuel. If I'm wanting to get just shy of $100 in on diversifiers, the contests I was looking at were the Wiffle, the Pinch Hit, the Beanball, and the Squeeze. To come in around that dollar limit, uh, one could max out the Wiffle, Pinch Hit, Beanball, and then throw a handful into the Squeeze. That would have amount to approximately 350 lines. Would it be best to run a build for those 350 with sliders somewhere in between the defaults for the Beanball and the Wiffle, or given contest structure, run a build of 300 for the Wiffle and Pinch Hit? And then another 50 for the beanball and squeeze. Thanks as always. So uh, good question here. I did just want to note, you know, one thing on this here is to be like, to be a little bit careful. So the, the reason we create a range for diversifiers is so that you allow every contest in your diversifier pool to be a true diversifier, right? So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is, I'm trying to think about the right way to say this. It's not a, it's not purely a contest characteristic that makes an entry a diversifying entry, right? Like two entries into the squeeze just to hit a hundred dollars wouldn't really be a very diversifying factor for you, right? Like, especially if the rest of your money is going into five cent and 25 cent and even $2 
other diversifiers, right? Like those almost kind of function more as elevator contests, ROI booster kind of contests at that particular point. Um, in a, as a general rule of thumb, if you can't play 20 lineups into a contest, it probably isn't really serving as a diversifier for you, right? Uh, and then I would ask, can you get to 50% of diversifiers or, or, or 75%? Can you, can you end up in that window 50 to 75% without that contest, right? Because you're actually probably at that point, just you probably, you know, giving yourself a higher, as long as those lineups that are going into that contest are plus EV, you're probably giving yourself a higher theoretical ROI, but you're also probably increasing your swings and variance at that point, which isn't really what diversifiers are intended to do. So all of that to say, you know, just make sure, you know, if you're entering those, if you're throwing a few lineups into the, the flagship GPP, just to get to maxed out 75% diversifier contests. Not that I guess, I suppose it really matters in the grand scheme of things, how you choose to bucket those one way or the other, but just keep in mind that those might not be as diversifying as you think. Now, the second question here, I think gets a little bit more interesting um, of like how to actually build these lineups. So all of our contest selection research that we did here kind of assumes a unique lineup into every contest. And it would it would assume, I, I guess it assumes a couple things. It, it assumes that you are just okay with the risk that is at play there, right? Where you're just saying, you know, if a lineup, if a lineup ends up in the whiffle, instead of being that one lineup that goes into the squeeze or a handful that goes into the squeeze, you're okay having that level of, of a massive swing. Um, I talked to Eric about that when we did our interview show at the end of this. And, you know, it's it's kind of just, it's the table stakes of this contest selection framework that you have to be okay with that kind of level of randomness. It's a little, I don't know, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I think there's also a little bit more questions. I think there's a little bit more of an interesting question here of... Um, you know, should you actually separate these out and and build them separately, given that the the lineup constraints are are different? I guess I'll handle that one first. So for me personally, you know, I'm generally I'm pretty comfortable picking a midpoint set of sliders when I'm building a whole contest portfolio. Essentially, no matter how much how I'm doing it, right? Um, I found that you know if you're looking for that midpoint, the 20 max, uh, 10 to 50k entrance just does a pretty good job of just making you kind of like generally sound GPP lineups that work and fit for both the single entry, smaller field elevator type stuff and the larger field, 150 max type stuff. Um, when I've, when I've done this in the past, I've leaned on picking sliders, midpoint sliders that are a little bit more on the like larger side on the higher side, just because I would rather play a lineup. That's maybe a little bit too risky, maybe a little bit too contrarian for a single entry than play a ton of lineups into the multi-entry stuff that are far too chalky to be successful there. Um, but I, I have no problem picking that midpoint set of sliders and building for, you know, especially if you're grouping all of your diversifiers together. When I've been doing this, I've been grouping all of my contests together and building everything together. And I'm still pretty happy with that. Even if I wouldn't separate out 20 maxes or separate out the beanball and the squeeze and then separate out the um, whiffle and the pinch hit or something like that, just to just to say you did and just so you could use the perfect right sliders for those contests. I don't think that's a good use of time. Um, personally, I, I don't think your lineups, your your lineups between the 20 and 150 max contests, it's like even if this is kind of the beanball, right? 1,000 to 10,000. And this is like the the whiffle right? Like you are not going to get enormously different results here between these sets of sliders. You're just not. Um, so I wouldn't worry so much about that. I do think there is, I think the more interesting part of this conversation here, at least for me, the thing that I struggle with, uh, at least somewhat regularly here is the unique lineup thing. Um, I do think, you know, I, I, I think you have to make some choices there about what's right for you. Uh, I have, I have preferred as I've been kind of making this contest selection framework work for me a little bit more. I, I've been preferring to just play um, the same 150 in all my 150s uh, and then pick randomly from that to fill my my 20 maxes and randomly from that to fill my elevators, which does increase my variance a little bit, but I've been scaling back my bankroll. And what that allows me to do, I've been scaling back my bankroll that I'm investing in the, in into individual slates. And what that allows me to do is feel a little less gross about the best possible lineup ending up in the absolute lowest dollar contest. But some of that is going to be personal risk tolerance. And if you're playing up to that max 5% bankroll per slate, that is kind of our top end maximum number that we recommend, you probably would be better off playing a unique lineup into every single contest. So um, 
Anyway, I guess I should be very clear here because I think I read this question and then I kind of decided what what I wanted to answer here. But I do want to be I do want to be clear here. Um, I would say, uh, I would probably I would I would probably say as the question is exactly as written here, I would run a build for the three hundred and fifty with sliders set somewhere in between the defaults. Um, I don't think the I don't think the contest structure or strategy differs enough that I would want to separate these out and play with optimal sliders for those. So. Um, to both Phantom and Toasted Taters, since you guys both kind of asked this question, let me know if that helps. Um, I realized that that I, I kind of answered the, the maybe a question that I thought was implied there, um, maybe a little bit more than the actual question as it was written. So hopefully uh, we were able to wrap around to what you were a- actually asking about there. Um, let's jump uh, over here, I guess jump backwards and, and answer this question from Rogue here. Um, and uh, he said, when you were adjusting sliders, does switching between the 20 max and 150 max lineups impact any variables in the background that SaberSim uses? Aside from the number of lineups selected, do the sliders strictly govern the pool parameters or does entry limit? Okay, good question. So these drop downs do nothing apart from setting the sliders to different values. They don't, they, these are not, these do not change the way the builder works otherwise. So let me put it, let me put it another way, right? Like if you were to say, you know, this is, this is the 150 max 50K, right? The sliders are eight, five, and seven. If you were to run a build on these settings and then compare to this, for example, right? The build logic would be identical between the two. The fact that single entry, the fact that entry limit is set to single entry and entrance is set to 11 to 100, even though the sliders are exactly the same, that doesn't matter. All we care about is ultimately what the sliders are actually set. The drop downs are only are basically only tools to help you get the sliders to the right spots. So they they themselves do not impact the build logic. But good question. Um, okay, and then Jimmy asks an interesting one here, um, kind of an open ended one here. Um, so I I uh, it says PGA twenty maxes. How would you use Sabersim to attack a slate? What are some key things to look for? Bonus question: How do you win? Uh, okay. So kind of a tough question here. So, I mean, so first of all, I think, I think golf can be a little tough, right? Um, I think, you know, primarily because some of the things that we rely on for, I would say typical edges, um, are a little bit smaller, right? You can, on certain slates, you can get a correlative element based on weather, but there broadly speaking is not a lot of correlation, right? Correlation, uh, adds to our, Correlation gives us an edge a lot in DFS because we are, you know, we can create a lineup that has a greater than it's. Imp- if you were picking, uh, if you were building a lineup of eight players and you had to pick eight independent events, right? There would be an implied, there would be some implied probability of that being successful, like an eight gate, like an eight per player parlay or something like that, right? Or an eight piece, uh, eight way parlay or something like that, right? When we correlate a lineup, we essentially we can like. We can make a like an outcome that is a an, a lineup that's has an outcome of success that is more likely than implied, but the prize structure is static in a contest, right? That's like literally why correlation ends up being useful for us. We can take two players that maybe otherwise would be independent, independent probabilities in a lineup and make them more likely to be successful. We don't really get that in golf, right? Unless there's weather, but we generally don't really get that. Ownership is another edge a lot of times where we can get a little bit of an edge in DFS, right? Where you have uh, a player whose probability, whose who the field is overvaluing that player's probability of being in the winning lineup in a given contest, right? And by, you know, being under on that player, we can push that edge. We can exploit that edge, right? Well, in golf, ownerships are somewhat more efficient than you would see in something like, I would say, baseball, right? Uh, I think part of the reason that is true is that because salaries are actually pretty efficient, right? There aren't going to be, uh, you know, there's not going to be a low owned must have play in golf very often. You'll have uh, maybe a, um, or a low salary must have play that the field is just suboptimally rostering or something like that, right? It's generally pretty, pretty solid. So all that to say, I mean, I I think golf DFS is really fun. Um, I think it's a really interesting kind of game theory problem, but I do think it's a little bit harder of a sport to reliably beat consistently uh, over, over a long period of time. Uh, a couple things that I do, I would say ultimately my approach for, for golf DFS ends up being very heavily focused on ownership. Uh, and I make 
big use of research builds here to get a sense of, based on the simulations, how likely players are to show up in the optimal lineup. Um, I do think one of the saving graces here of golf is, especially if you're playing uh, large field GPPs, a lot of times, you know, that winning lineup, I, I, I don't know if it's going to necessarily be the exact optimal, but it does approach the optimal. And I think research builds do a pretty good job of, especially for the larger field stuff, assessing the probability of different golfers being in that optimal. Um, one potential issue here is that at the moment, I think our ownership projections for golf do kind of miss some nuance. Um, I think in particular, they miss some some narrative steam type uh, nuance where a player who maybe has uh, had a lot of course history at that particular course or a lot of recent success, we might under project relative to how high they're actually going to be. So what I actually end up doing a lot of times, especially, you know, it's early in the week, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly where ownership is going to end up. But I will a lot of times kind of do my, my first research build as a way to guess, to also guess against ownership, right? So I'm basically saying, you know, for example, uh, Rory is a, a decent example, right? Like Rory's efficient ownership, according to the simulations are 16.1%, right? Do I think his ownership is going to be higher or lower than that based on uh, what I'm seeing come out through the week, what the general buzz is, what Saber Sims ownership projections are, uh, and then making essentially an individual decision. A lot of times I will go through and when I'm finally actually done and ready to build my golf lineups, I will have adjusted almost every single ownership projection for a golfer, right? Um, and I'm basically trying to figure out, you know, if this is the fair number, right? If this is the number where they should be rostered, what is this number going to be? Or where is this number going to be? And then what decision do I want to make on that particular player? Um, and I think at the end of the day, the biggest edge that I've found to be able to push consistently is that ownership on golf. So after I go through, you know, again, I'll, I'll figure out what, I'll figure out where do I think this number is going to end up here, um, make some adjustments to the ownership proje projections. And then I like typically to go through and bump up player projections up or down based on whether or not I think the field is going to be inefficient or efficient with their ownership. Right. So like maybe, um, you know, if I actually do think Cantley is going to be pretty chalky this week, so I might bring him down. Um, and I might look for a guy that I do think is going to be a little bit lower in this range. Um, I think Sung Jay, uh, disappointed people when he was very chalky last week. I think he could be a little bit less popular. Um, and I might bump him up if he was showing up in my research builds or something like that. Um, so, I guess ultimately, and, and the one other thing I wanted to note there is that I typically, I like to push ownership edges more at the high end, right? When you're talking about high salary golfers, because again, like salaries are not perfect when it comes to golf DFS, but they're pretty efficient. So when you see a situation where you've got a guy that, you know, is maybe triple the salary, you've got one golfer that, is, or you not triple, you got one golfer that is double the ownership of another and very close in salary. It's very likely from my perspective, it's it's like exceedingly likely that this that that ownership is inefficient, right? Uh, it is it it can't it can't be that uh, a can't lay is really truly two times more likely to end up in the optimal lineup than Sam Burns, from my perspective, right? Uh, and the Sims, you know, would would kind of uh, agree with that, right? If Burns has a thirteen point five percent chance to top five, and can't lay has a sixteen point five five percent chance to top five, right? How is it? How is it that it is efficient to to that the field is rostering Cantlay two times as often as Burns? Like right? those are kind of the 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 exploitative edges that I'm looking to push, right? And I don't even really even need to run a research build to see that, right? I can just kind of look and 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 study this and decide that you know if I had to make a decision right now, I would probably be over on 15% Sam Burns and under on 15% Cantlay, right? Um, but again, I mean, that we're talking about, you know, maybe I have 25% burns and 15% can't lay, right? We're not, we're not talking about, for me, it's not massive fades of these guys. Uh, there are much bigger ownership mistakes, um, you know, just compared to baseball, for example, right? You might get, you might get a, a chalky stack, uh, the Padres and Coors last week, 35, 40% owned hitters who have a 10% chance of being in the optimal lineup, right? There's a much bigger ownership inefficiency there. And that's not even to talk about correlation. So um, that was kind of like a quick overview, I guess, of what I'm thinking about when it comes to golf DFS. Um, we do have a, vi we do have some videos up on our YouTube channel here, um, where I've done a deeper dive into this before. 
Um, so if you go and search, you know, PGA, we have a couple of videos. Some of these are a little bit older, but these go a little bit more into uh, detail here. Um, I also, you know, I've talked a, quite a bit about my golf strategy in more detail in past shows. Um, and if you search PGA, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of these here. And I, I, I'd recommend going through and poking through them a little bit here. Um, the one other note I'll make on this before we move on is that, you know, I I've mentioned, I mentioned here pretty much every time somebody asks me about my golf strategy, that I think there are issues with our golf ownership projections at times. Um, that's something that we're actually working on right now. Uh, and we want to, to improve, um, I think it would make the research builds a little bit more effective if like you could really kind of truly like trust the the ownership projections as they are. A lot of my process at the moment ends up being like listening to other shows and watching other content and figuring out what, like who is actually going to be chalky and where is our ownership right and where is it wrong uh, and adjusting from there. Once we, once we get that improved, um, I think there it will be a lot easier to just kind of, you know, uh, run a research build, trust that the ownership projections are are pretty accurate there, uh, and act on it. Um, right now, I almost, you know, I almost have to end up using them as like a weird like, if if this is efficient, where is this number going to end up being, and then making a decision um, as opposed to just using it as it is. So anyway, um, but. I hope that was kind of helpful. I, I realized that was a little bit all over the place. I think again, that's that's partly just because I I, I think it can sometimes be a little bit hard to to totally to totally trust those ownership numbers at the moment. But yeah, um, Ryan had asked. Uh, let's see, another question as a follow up here. Um, playing PGA on uh, Yahoo this week. Wondering if you have any different experiences playing golf on that site versus FanDuel or DK ownership salary, playing more lineups versus the other sites. Thanks. I actually have never played golf on Yahoo. Um, so I don't really know. Um, let me see here. Let me get this pulled up. Um, I don't really know what to expect. Let me pull this up here. And see if there's anything that jumps off the page to me here. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to be hard for me to just kind of wing it here with different strategy. Um, I mean, I guess like the one thing that would probably come to mind here is that, you know, I don't think, I think this is even true of FanDuel. DraftKings kind of dominates the golf space. Um, a lot of content out there is written for DraftKings and DraftKings salaries and DraftKings ownership projections and things like that. Um, I would probably, I, I probably think that makes Yahoo and FanDuel a little bit softer, right? Like there's less information out there for it that are, that is particularly geared toward these sites. I think it probably makes the fields play a little bit softer. I think since the, since DraftKings also kind of has a bit of a hold on the, the payout structures there or the payout, the prize pools, sorry, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and there's smaller prize pools on these sites. I think it attracts a little bit of a softer like field, right? Like there's less, um, there's going to be very sh sharp players for whom a, a 5k prize pool and a 1700 person field isn't just isn't even worth building for uh, on Yahoo. I think all of that's going to serve to make the field a little bit more softer. So I think that would probably make me feel like a little bit less like I needed to push an ownership edge, right? Like you might get, you might get by with just kind of trusting the simulations a little bit more and relying on the fact that other people just have less powerful tools to work with when building their lineups um, and go that way. But that's kind of just a little bit of like a gut check reaction I have here um, that I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think ownership will probably be a little less efficient on these sites, but I also think it'll be a little bit more random. Like it might be hard to, you know, reliably fade a guy that you think is going to be chalky because it, it could very well be that he just isn't. Uh, and then you took a stand on a, on a premise that isn't even there. Um, so I would probably say that's, that's how I would probably approach it. I would probably scale back. I would scale off of trying to, you know, push an ownership edge and play more contrarian here. Also because it's a smaller field um, and roll a little bit more with what is implied with the, the simulations here. So 
Um, but good question there. And again, I, I that, that comes with the caveat of I haven't I have not played any Yahoo uh, golf DFS. So. All right. Cool. Um, and then Ryan had said earlier too as well, Yahoo for some reason ran a second 3K to first contest. It was hidden in the lobby, so it only filled 50%, maxed it, and finished second for a nice little 1500 day. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, and I should, maybe I should get back into Yahoo a little bit. I haven't played there in a while. Um, I Last time I was playing Yahoo regularly was when they were uh, running the, the overlay contests. Um, but I haven't seen those here in a while. Guaranteed overlay. So I know they will be back for football, I'm sure. Um, Rogue said on these large slates, how do you decide what pitcher chalk to eat or fade? Uh, you know, honestly, it ends up a lot of times coming down to my research builds again here. Um, and let's see, it is a, it is a combination of like finding where that ownership is inefficient and also how likely those players are to be optimal themselves. And I guess also what the batting situation looks like overall. So let's run one, uh, and see what we get. Um, and I'll kind of talk through it a little bit. So give this a moment to build here because I do want a full research build to talk about this. But yeah, I mean, almost all of these uh, these ownership type questions for me end up getting answered with this research build. I mean, it is so so core to my process um, that that's kind of it's kind of how I do it. But I do think pitching is interesting because, you know, a lot of times it's uh, with stacks, it's very easy to, you know, to look at the look at the hitters on the chalkiest team that night and you know, they're maybe 25% owned or something like that. And they have a 7% chance, a 10% chance of being in the optimal lineup. Right. Very easy to say, you know what? Let's skip that. I'll go play somebody else. But with pitchers, you know, you might have the guy that's, you know, Menea 50% owned tonight might be 30% likely to be in the optimal lineup. Right. Like how do you, how do you navigate that? You're fading a lot more equity uh, and you're fading a lot more. You're, you're just removing a lot more lineups from your pool when you fade a guy like that. So, um, we'll talk about what I, what I kind of look at here. Um, so, all right, give this a moment to load here. So, uh, I know the leverage trick just, uh, more so past that. I, like I know Manea is the fade. I can't figure out the value if the value for Cortez is worth it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, so like, okay, first of all, I, I don't think either of these plays are, are great, right? Like Manea has a 25% chance to be one of the optimal two pitchers. Cortez has an 18% chance to be one of the optimal two pitchers and they are be ro- they are being rostered at the moment. We are projecting them to be rostered far and away more likely than they are to be that optimal pitcher, right? There's negative 25.5% percentage points of leverage, negative 20.9. I mean, one thing that I like to ask myself, you know, is, uh, you know, we can kind of just play with these numbers. So one, you know, something that jumps out here, like I don't think Cortez is the pivot, but I think Gosman starts to be interesting here. Um, right. Where you're talking about, you are, you are gaining back what 20, 20 points of ownership in the case of Cortez, in the case of Manea, you're gaining back 35 points of ownership, uh, and only sacrificing three and a half percentage points of, of likelihood of being optimal versus, or 10% percentage points of being like, like the optimal. Right. So I'm, I'm become pretty interested in fading these guys. Uh, the other way to look at this too, or something to be aware of is if you, if you completely fade both of them, you are going to basically wipe out, uh, you know, what, 40, 42 percentage points of 42% of basically all of the lineups that are, that could be optimal. Right. That's a lot. So for me, I, I, I would say in general, I would probably be less likely to say like, I'm going to fade both of them completely, but I might say I'm going to be half the field on both at most. uh, And maybe I refuse to play both of them in the same lineup or something like that. Right. Because that is, that is the one thing that happens with pitchers is you'll almost always see this. The two or three pitchers that are the most likely to be optimal are also going to be the most over-owned. But if you fade them, you wipe out a ton of lineups. If you fade both of them completely. Right. Um, and, and you, you don't necessarily want either side of that. Uh, it also depends on how many lineups you're playing. If you're only playing 20 lineups, well, then it's kind of easy. I think it's much easier to potentially fade both of them because you only have to come up with, with 20 other lineups, right? Um, but 
that's that's kind of like the way I, I think about it is it's not it's not necessarily just blindly following this number. It's it's like it's 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 everything. Everything kind of matters here. It's how likely is their raw probability of success, right? How likely is the raw probability of either of them being successful, right? Um, so, and then and then how and then what's the opportunity cost of that, right? Like if we look at hitters too, you know, another good example um, is okay. So what's the chalk tonight? Angels and angels. It looks like right. I mean, it's it's so much easier to just kind of like blindly take stands on on hitters here than it is on pitchers. Right. I mean, Trout doesn't even stand out as like a particularly elite play when you look at his percent chance of being in the optimal lineup. But the ownership projection would imply that he does. Can we find another player that has a similar salary and plays a similar position that has a 5% chance of being in the optimal lineup? Of course. I mean, look look how many players have that probability. Right. When we fade Mane, we are, we are absolutely fading. I mean, we are playing, we are fading a player that is clearly the best pitching play on the slate. But what do we get out of that and how much can we be comfortable fading? Right. Those are the kinds of things that, that I like to think about here. So, I mean, broad strokes, ultimately I'm way willing to stack. Uh, I'm way willing. I'm may, way more willing to uh, take a stand on hitters and stacks than I am on pitchers in terms of like a full fade type thing. Um, so, but, yeah. And I mean, I guess it's like a thought experiment. You know, if this number was 35, right? Then, you know, what? If you go down to Gosman, you lose like you you lose 10 percentage points of uh likelihood of being optimal to, you know, win back, I don't know. And this would probably be up to like 20 at that point if this was 35. So you're winning back what? 15 percentage points of ownership at that point. Why, why make that trade? So Rogue said that changed since I last made my research build. Cortez was minus 10, low whoops. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess like that. Okay. So like, let's use that example. So let's say that for, for the sake of Cortez, that this was um, minus 10, right? Uh, and that would probably imply that, you know, if this number was, if this number was 30, then Gosman's number would probably be higher, Right. Then maybe we're now maybe that trade isn't as sharp, right? Maybe we don't want to maybe we don't want to make that that trade as as often, right? Because we are getting we are trading more win equity for less ownership. But there are there are not I can kind of with this kind of stuff I feel like I can kind of only really teach the tools or the things that I think about. Ultimately, it's hard to to necessarily say or to look at every single situation and say I would handle it this way. And and I'm not even going to be right every time. Right. The research build is kind of like a, a system of coming and making some of these own decisions for yourself. But I'm not going to be able to say, you know, this is what you should have done. This is what you should do. Um, a lot of that in a lot of that is going to be your own personal strategy uh, and your own personal risk tolerance. So um, but uh, Patrick said there's the 222 micro mini 150 max on DK today, top heavy payout. Yeah, yes, there is. Um it's a kind of an expensive contest at 150 max to to max out. Um like one of the more one of the more expensive ones out there. Um so, but it's 10k up top, which is about as high as it gets about as high as it gets in baseball while being under the threshold uh for um where experienced players cannot play that contest. So, um should be uh should be a good one. We were talking about these micro million promotions yesterday. Um, definitely, definitely fun for for the low stakes grinders like like me. So, um, eight game said I'm not allowed to play the 222. It was my favorite. If I was allowed, I'd enter every day. Um, oh, I thought he meant yeah. Fanduel has the 222. I mean, the Beanball 222 on Fanduel is a good contest too. Um, but there is that uh, that unique 222 on DraftKings today, which is pretty cool. So. Then Patrick said, "Will you send a message to Kadri? Let him know to put his big boy undies on and play in Game Four. Yeah, it, I, it's. Uh, I don't even know if this is about toughing it out. I, I, I mean, it sounds like he he broke his thumb, right? I feel like it's pretty hard to to hit a hockey puck with a with a broken broken thumb. But he was shooting. I know he was. Uh, he was. Um, he was shooting the other day. So we'll see. See if we get him back. But." Was a little bit of a letdown game for the Avs yesterday. It's kind of what I expected. I was talking about that yesterday as well. 
Um, just there's, there's no tougher game to win than game three on the road when you're up 2-0, right? That's just like a brutally hard game to, to win. Um, okay, let's get to this question here uh, from Joey. This is in uh, the Slack channel here. This might be something that the support team uh, can can do a little bit more to troubleshoot, but I can talk about this here. He said, I'm trying to import max exposures for MLB into SaberSim and multiply the numbers by 1.2 to make it easier for SaberSim to make lineups. But after the build, no lineups are made. I have no rules. Interesting. Um, yeah. So... One thing, so you're trying to import max exposures. So I have, a, this is going to be hard for me to like really troubleshoot. Um, this is a good one. I would say, you know, if you're running into issues like this, uh, you will probably ju in general be better off using the report a problem link in the settings menu to send that directly to support. They get all kinds of information about your, your session, your data, so that they can kind of figure out exactly what's going on there. But one thing I will kind of recommend, and this is more of a general piece of advice, uh, would be instead to use the maximum exposure tool here in the builder and set that approximately to, you know, something kind of close to what you are looking for. Like, let's say you're building 150, right? It's a 13 game slate. There's 26 teams playing baseball. There's a ton of players in the pool. When you set a, a max exposure on every single player in the, in the pool, it can put a lot of stress on the builder, right? That can be kind of a lot for it to, to figure out how it's going to use every single player. If instead... You know, one thing you do is maybe you say, I don't want, you know, maybe maybe you don't want more than 30% of any hitter and 50% of any pitcher, right? Well, you can come in here and say 50 max exposure and then build this. And then what that's going to do is you're not going to have more than 50% of anyone. And then you can go in and kind of fine tune and dial in and get things where you want them to be in the post build process. Or another thing you could do if that wasn't diversifying enough is increase the sim precision slider and then dial things in, in the post build process. Um, so toasted tater says it doesn't allow enough exposure for the build. I've ran into the same issue, limiting the build too much. Yeah. I, I think, I, I think in general, the, like setting a max exposure for every single player, just it, it is a little bit overkill in terms of like needing to do it. I think you can get away with setting a, a global max exposure and fine tuning after and it also seems to just kind of max out saber sim a little bit um it doesn't saber sim doesn't seem to be super kind of receptive of that so we'll finish this build um and i'll show you what i mean about like kind of dialing in and fine tuning here um in the post build process but and again feel free to send that message over to the support team too sometimes you know there's something might be in your session that that i'm missing here my abilities to to troubleshoot live on stream are um are somewhat limited with this kind of stuff so, um, but so anyway, this build will finish. We set that max exposure to 50, right? So that means we're going to get max 50% to any one player in both our set of lineups and our pool. So this should have a be, be a very nicely diversified set of lineups. Um, if we wanted to come in here and like limit batters further, we can do that. We can go in and start setting these to 30 and you see that right? After just one player, all of a sudden, all of my max exposures are 30. And I think, I think that, I think that in general, like that's just on, honestly a lot easier than, than, um, I don't know, than, than like going and setting a uh, player exposure for every single player. I, I think that's just a lot of work. So, but anyway, Eight games that I'm locked into the DK 2022 or 222. Sweet. Take it down. All right. Let's see. Um, Mr. T, you know, this is actually a funny question here. Um, and uh, he said, um, you were hinting yesterday about your worries for future MLB contests as you've done in the past. Can you elaborate on your concerns? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Uh, I was What I was talking about yesterday is you know, it seems like year over year that the baseball DFS product is getting a little bit smaller, right? Like we were talking yesterday about the $3.20 max on DraftKings, the promotional micro moonshot contest, uh, which used to be a contest that got ran every single day. And it ran alongside the $4.20 max, right? Like there was enough excitement about MLB DFS that they could support both of those contests. Um, and there isn't anymore. Uh, and it does seem like in general year over year contest sizing for baseball has gotten smaller. That was my concern is that I think it implies that that, that 
particular sport is shrinking a little bit, especially compared to other sports that are clearly growing, right? Like golf contests year over year continue to get bigger. Um, basketball and football contests are bigger. Uh, the, you can just, I mean, you can just see them. They are, they are larger. However, uh, everything is bigger t- today on both sites. Like the $1.20 max on DraftKings, the solo shot is 12,000 entries, which is the biggest it's been all season. And it's not a part of the Micro Millions promotion. It just is bigger. Um, the pinch hit, the quarter 150 max on uh, the, Let me say this. The flagship contests are always what they are, right? There's always a 50K to first or 100K to first on DraftKings every single night. I'm not really talking about that. That that will be the last contest to, to shrink or get smaller. I'm kind of talking about the auxiliary, the lower stake stuff, right? Those can kind of be a good indicator about the level of excitement in a sport. Um, today, everything's bigger. So like... I don't know. I mean, maybe they've gotten, maybe like the algorithms have changed about the way that they size these contests and, you know, NBA is over now. So maybe there's like a push um, to, to jump into these. I, I don't know. Um, so to clarify, right. To, to elaborate here. Um, all I was referring to is that it appears that contest sizing for baseball DFS has gotten smaller on both sites, but this week and today, it seems like, things have been pumped up a little bit more. Um, so maybe, maybe I am misremembering, um, maybe, or maybe, you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, both sites have, have a lot of sharp people working on their, the algorithms to size contests. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if maybe, you know, most sports, I would say that probably the biggest weeks with the biggest contest sizes are the, are the first week, uh, maybe for a sport like baseball, the best, the biggest push for baseball DFS comes in, in June after NBA ends. Um, and, you know, that, that would make sense to me, but I don't know. So that's all I was referring to. And I'm not trying to like stoke fear or panic or anything about it either. I just think it's, I, it, anecdotally, it seemed like contests have gotten a little bit smaller to me over the years for baseball. So, um, Patrick said, could you recall the first day Saber was released to the public? Was it just a basic optimizer in the early stages? Uh, would like to know what is different then and what is now. Um, I, so I, I started using Saber Sim four years ago and I was, when I started using it, I was, I was using what was called, already called Saber Sim version two. Um, so it goes much further back, uh, than that. Um, a good set of videos here. If you want to go see some older versions of, um, let's see, um, Let's see. Let me see if I can find this. Okay. So, um, yeah, here we go. Hold on. I need to find the, uh, the playlist here for this. Oh, there isn't a playlist. Okay. So here, I'll just pull this up. Um, so bridge the gap, um, kind of a old, DFS content creator. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't make videos anymore. Um, John Gustafson, he used to make these here. Looks like he stopped around two years ago. Um, he did a SaberSim video series, which is actually part of the way that I found SaberSim. Um, but if you want to see some older versions of the app, uh, kind of a cool, um, I don't know, kind of a cool way to, to see how far we've come, uh, three years ago. Um, so this would have been, right around the time that I first started using, using Saber Sim. And I think he also had uh, some, some videos here of like Saber Sim version one, uh, which were up as well. So, uh, but there's also, uh, you know, if you do a little bit of digging out there on the internet, there's some like older uh, articles and things like that written uh, about the original baseball Sims that kind of represented that kind of made up Saber Sim. So um, there's, there's stuff out there, but I think if you just want to go play around and see what like older versions look like uh, this video series, it's also pretty good. Um, like, so it's, it's like pretty good content. Um, like I used to, I used to watch a lot of John stuff. So, but uh, eight games says, should I use 300 lineups between the two twenty two and the $15 unique random um, that's up to you. It depends on your risk tolerance. I would say the maximizing upside and minimizing risk answer to this would be yes. Um, even if you took down the 222 
and by pure luck, it was in the wrong contest, you would you would still be profitable on the night, right? You would still be up, you know, still be up pretty good. Uh, 8K, right? That's a $10,000 to first, I think probably. But you would have to deal with the fact that you're winning 10K instead of 50 um, or, or maybe 100 or whatever it is. Um, uh, at the same time, it's, you know, you have way more opportunities to win. So I think our, our like strict contest selection recommendations would probably say, yes, I would in this situation. But you need to be comfortable with the the risk. You need to be comfortable with the kind of randomness that's associated with that, where, you know, by pure luck, even if you use unique rank, right? By by pure luck, your best lineup could be in the 222. Um, so, but with those two contests, I probably would. I think a general rule of thumb, here's a, here's a very general rule of thumb when I'm trying to decide if I'm going to play a unique lineup in every contest, is if I took one of those contests down, uh, a ran- the, if I took the lowest payout, the lowest prize to first contest down, would I still be profitable on the night? Um, and if the answer is yes, then it's probably worth unique filling everything. So, uh, Don says, been in the doldrums after the Saberson changes. I'm sure that's just due to variance. Yeah, it probably is. Um, it probably is. I, it's only been a, a couple weeks. Um, you know, remember our according to our 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 contest sims that we did, right? Profitable player six to eight profitable days a month, on average, right? So we had in our contest sims we had uh, losing streaks, losing streaks, right? Com- unprofitable day streaks of up to fifteen to twenty five days a season, right? Like you're you're in general, if you're going to play every single day baseball DFS, you should be expecting that most likely at one point throughout that season, you will have a, a unprofitable day streak of up to 25 consecutive slates. So yeah, it's probably variance, but. Um, Aaron said, I only use Sabre for baseball, then leave right after. Yeah. I think uh, early Sabre Sim definitely had a little bit of that perception of being, um, well, it was baseball only for a while. And then I think for a while after that, it had a perception of being baseball only. Um, or baseball best. Um, but I think we've really branched out now. And, um, you know, I, I, at least in terms of the, our user base, I think baseball is our, our third most popular sport with, with football and, and basketball ahead of it now. So, um, Patrick, has the team discussed any software updates for the upcoming NFL season? Uh, if so, could you hint what we might expect to see in the fall? Um, I don't. Uh, we, ha- I, we haven't really necessarily started talking so much about specifically football updates. Um, as we get into July and especially August, we'll definitely start looking, uh, that direction. And, um, as I become a little bit more aware of, of what's, what's to come, I'll, I'll mention it here on this show. Um, if you are interested, one thing that, um, could be a cool thing to dig into here is, um, let me see. Um, where you would find this. Yeah. So, okay. So if you go to our YouTube channel here, um, and search NFL model, uh, you'll see this video, how a Saber Sims NFL DFS simulator works. So we did this, we do these streams at the start of all major sports. So this was basically Matt and Will coming on to talk about the updates we made to the NFL Sims last year. Um, one of the last questions I always ask the guys on those streams is what's, what's next. What do we work on? What do we want to work on next? Um, a lot of the, whatever the answer was to that question, I can't even remember what it was, uh, but whatever they said then is probably a lot of what we're going to be working on heading into this year. Um, so maybe I should go look. I'd actually be kind of curious um, what that was, but um, yeah, I, I'd have to kind of go back and, and remember. And that's that's just the Sims. That's just the model. Uh, there are um, a lot of, of features and like, app features that we want to add as well before the start of, of football season. So um, one, I think that, you know, you could probably expect to see before the start of football is a more robust rules kind of dashboard is kind of the the way we're thinking about it a little bit more. You know, we have player groups, we have stacking rules, but adding more to that, um, making it kind of more cohesive to use, having all that stuff all in one place. Um, definitely some, some goals with that. So. Cool. All right. I think, uh, 
Oh, here's, a, here's interesting. Aaron said, I'm interested in what people's goals are for playing DFS. Yeah, I I think it's important to, to define what your goal is, right? I think that's a, an important thing when you're thinking about your your strategy and your bankroll investment and and how you're committing yourself uh, to to DFS. Um, I think it's a good idea to 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 talk about that, um, to define that. So, um, yeah, that's uh, I know the the theory of DFS guys, um, James and Jordan Cooper, Blenderhead. Um, they talk about that a lot in their their content about uh, you know, or in the audio book, the masterclass um, about setting setting a goal and figuring out what your goals are is important. And I agree. Patrick says, does the late swap still apply like it does in the NBA for the NFL? Uh, it is it's, it is probably the second most important late swap sport. Uh, NBA is a different breed in terms of the, the late swap. Like NBA has the trifecta of you have to late swap often because of all the different game start times. And it's also very impactful and the field doesn't really do it, right? You have kind of all three of those. Uh, so it just ends up being this massive edge. In football, uh, it happens, late swap, happens less often one because there's kind of one big late swap window where after the early games end before the afternoon games start, you kind of have your one late swap opportunity. Um, but there's also less, I would say there's less news that breaks that like totally changes the slate in that window. And it's generally less impactful when it does break, right? Like there are, there is still impactful news that can come out at that time. Um, you know, a big one would be, you know, like, Dalvin Cook is questionable going into the afternoon games. Oh, now he's out and you can play Alexander Madison, who's starting at 5K on DraftKings or something like that, who's, uh, whose average projection is probably like 4X his salary or something like that, right? Like that's that's a good situation. But a lot of times also, you know, it's not, there's there's other inactives news that doesn't come, that comes out that doesn't really like break the slate in the same way it does for, for basketball. Um there is still a big edge in basket in NFL late swap because the field basically, you know, the field in NFL is really soft. And I would say the vast majority of people don't even know there is late swap or just ignore it completely. So there's definitely an edge there. Uh, it's valuable. I think it's, I think it's a little bit less. It's uh, it's, it probably has a little bit of a lower impact than in a sport like, like basketball. Um, but yeah, uh, last season, we didn't have the late swap tools that we have now for football. We didn't have late swap only lineups where a player is out. We also didn't have late quick swap player from same team. Um, that's going to be an interesting shakeup here. Um, we'll talk a little bit. I'll definitely do some late swap focused content for football as that season gets closer. Um, so, um, yeah, but... Uh, Mike says, what should you set your min uniques for 150? I always leave it at one. Um, I prefer, so the min uniques is a, is a, is kind of a brute force tool of forcing diversity into your lineups, right? You're basically telling the builder, even if the best two lineups you can build for this particular slate uh, are one player different, I don't want that lineup. I want max, I want minimum two players different in every lineup, right? I don't, I don't like that it is so brute forcey in that way. So I typically prefer to increase the sim precision slider to get more diversity, uh, which diversifies your lineups by looking at a fewer set of similar, a smaller set of simulations for each individual lineup. Um, so what I would recommend is if you build, I would recommend first build your lineups on default settings and study them and ask, do I like this portfolio of lineups? If the answer is no, and you want more diversity, I would start with increasing the sim precision slider. If you increase the sim precision slider and maybe you're up at nine or 10 and you still feel like your lineups are too similar, they're not different enough, then I think you can look at uh, increasing the min uniques setting. I think that's a good way to do it. I I prefer to, to leave this alone most of the time. Um, if you increase the min unique setting, I would probably never go beyond three. I think if you go beyond three, you are really starting to remove a lot of good lineups from your pool and not getting much out of it. So. Um, Patrick said the goal is to pay uncle Sam when you win money and guy who gamble said, pay yourself first. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, I mean, I think everybody's nobody's goal is to lose money playing DFS, but I think there are different goals. You know, I think it is a legitimate question to ask yourself, like what would be the maximum like that you would actually be comfortable playing on a given slate, right? Like how, how high do you want to, do you, would you truly want to grow your investment on a per slate basis to infinity, 
would you play, you know, if you're playing a hundred dollars a slate per, right now, would you play a thousand dollars? Would you play ten thousand dollars? Right? Like how high would that actually go? What what is your dream contest to be playing and entering every night? Right. That that answer is not going to be the same for everybody. So um, but um, eight game says, well, WNBA be supported. I think, yes, eventually, uh, it frankly is not, uh, our highest priority, um, right at the moment we are in the progress of working on tennis simulations, uh, and then college sports are next, um, at least in kind of the way that we're prioritizing things. Um, so those are, those are higher priorities. And I think that kind of gets us through most of the summer. And then, you know, obviously, Football and basketball uh, takes up a lot of our bandwidth and time, you know, working on those sports when those kick off. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're at the, you're at the new year. Um, and, you know, I guess kind of already starting to think about like baseball coming around the corner again. Um, summer, a lot of times is when we have the bandwidth and the time to work on new sport models. And I would say our goals for this summer are uh, tennis and, and the college sports. So uh, Don says, uh, what are your thoughts on when late swap asks replacement of the same team or best available for baseball? I always, assuming we're talking about a hitter, uh, I always, I, I basically do a very, I do the same order every single time. I will first try to swap best available from same team. Uh, and then if that fails, I will do best available anywhere. And if that fails, I will do the late swap only swap entries, uh, where I have a player that's out. That's basically my order every time. Basically, my goal is I don't want to rebuild every lineup just to fix uh, somebody that wasn't that was expected to be in the lineup that isn't right. So, and I want to maintain correlation as much as possible. So, I I try to swap with correlation first, see how much that works. If that doesn't work, then I say okay, I'll sacrifice a little correlation to put the best available player in there. And then if that doesn't work, I'll say okay, I'll rebuild the entire lineup to try to get players that are playing in. So that's the way I typically do it. AK says, do you ever press the print money button and test entering what the builder gives you? Yeah, I I think that's often fine, actually. Like, I I, I think it it's not necessarily always the case that you have to do a ton to get something out of SaberSim. And I think actually in general, when when people when people ultimately end up really, you know, having a lot of success with our tools, I think it's because you find that sweet spot of doing two. Like you kind of find that sweet spot there of, of how, where to add value and, and what to actually do. Uh, and it's often less than I think people think. I think, you know, in general, when I find that people uh, find SaberSim for the first time and are getting familiar with how to use our tools, uh, there's a lot of times, you know, you may have been taught by traditional optimizers where you have to do everything. Uh, and then you come in and try to do all of this different stuff and it, it just doesn't really work. Um, and, and peeling back the layers and figuring out, you know, what are, what are the individual things that you do that make your process unique, um, that you can kind of add in and, you know, add a little bit of value to the, to the process here are the most useful ones. Um, but yes, there are, there are slates sometimes where like, because something comes up or I don't otherwise have time that I do kind of just rock with what I'm getting. Um, there are, sports where I'm more likely to do that like basketball because of how late news breaks and how much it changes the slate you just can't do as much in basketball right like all of my I I don't do a lot of research builds I don't do a lot of like anything in basketball apart from just basically being ready to late swap at a moment's notice because it's kind of chaos and it's pretty hard to just stay it's pretty hard to get value out of doing anything pre-lock anyway um, because of how likely the slate is to change. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, um, <laughs> with pressing the print money button. And the other thing to remember two things on that one, it's, it's important to remember how much Saber Sim is automating for you behind the scenes, right? Or at least not, I don't even want to say necessarily automating, but how much it's helping to, to facilitate, right? Like if you think, you know, taking a, taking into account correlation and building good stacks, Considering ownership and making an ownership-based uh, uh, approach on each individual player, and also considering the true range of outcomes of each possible game and player on the slate, right? That is that is what happens behind the scenes when you build lineups with SaberSim. That would be a process. That would be an entire process on 
fantasy cruncher or something, right? Like figuring out how am I going to deal with ownership? How am I going to consider the the variety of range of outcomes of each player on the slate? And how am I going to build lineups that are correlated? Doing all of those things that you would have to do on a traditional optimizer, like it doesn't even have to be FC, it could be anything. That would be, I mean, that would probably take at least about 30 minutes to an hour of work, maybe more, uh, depending on the slate at the bare minimum. Um, and that would be somebody's process, right? That, would, that wouldn't even leave you any other time for really like strategizing. That would just be a process. That is totally automated. And then secondly, you're not getting the same thing. You're not getting the same thing out of Saberson that everybody else is on a given slate, right? Like if you just, if last night you just, you know, pushed build and built lineups, like, yeah, you probably would have had a lot of Garrett Cole. And I think uh, we were building lineups with a lot of Tiger stacks yesterday. And like, you might've gotten similar directions to other Saberson users, but because we actually pull from random simulations from a database of thousands of simulations for every lineup, you're never just going to like dupe somebody, right? So you're getting this like unique build that takes into account the most important things for you by default. And everything else on top of that is, is extra, right? Like is, is what makes your particular approach a little bit more unique. Um, but I, I think that's just like a very important thing. I think that's a very important thing to note um, because it is like, you know, other traditional optimizers aren't going to give you good lineups at all if you just press build. And when you press build on Sabersim, you're going to at least start with pretty good lineups. They're pretty, pretty solid. So um, Matt says, yes, sometimes with Sabersim, less can be more. I found if I tweak too much, I get worse results. Yeah. And like some of that might even just be variance uh, or, or whatever. But like, I think the, I think the most likely risk is not that you do something wrong. I think it's like you waste time, right. Uh, or get, or, or end up getting frustrated um, trying to like get, the builder to do something that you probably don't even need to do that actually doesn't even adding any value. So, um, but Patrick said, sometimes quick swap doesn't give you a player you want from the same team. Stassi swapped for Suzuki. Uh, didn't look appealing. Just did a late swap for that team. Yeah, I think that's fine too. Um, you know, doing quick swap, same player from same team. And if that fails, then just going to do a late swap um, and rebuilding all lineups with an out player. I think that's a fine approach too. So. Uh, Mr. T said, thanks for all the tips, Jordan. They really help. I was just behind you the other day in MLB, but then you accelerated away. It's good coming up against you in the charts. Yeah. I, what, I'm curious what your username was. I probably saw you, saw you on my tail there. Um, I had a, I had a pretty decent weekend there. Um, so, um, big Meech said, uh, do you guys have any upgrades planned for esports? I, I don't know if like in the immediate future, it's it's planned for us to work. We we actually just like somewhat recently, I would say like in the past, like earlier this spring, uh, both the League of Legends and the Counter-Strike models got quite a bit of love um, and the builder for both of those sports did as well. Um, so the, the builders now, at least as recently as this spring, um, like all of this, de- all of these detailed projections are, are new, uh, relatively new. The um, ranges of outcomes that pull up when you click on a player and the correlation data that comes up uh, is all new. And the the builder itself pulls now directly from the Sims themselves when it builds your lineups. So this was this was somewhat new as of this spring. And it came along with like kind of a, some TLC to the models as well. Um, some upgrades there. We've also done a lot of, you know, it's, this is, I, I think, a little less sexy, but we did some back-end work uh, to the the League of Legends builders and the API there that that works for those sports. So builds are quite a bit faster than they used to be as well. Um, again, that's all stuff that I would say is like max three or four months old. So not brand new, um, but but pretty recent. Um, I, I don't think there's any more planned um, there. So... At least not, I mean, obviously, you know, we'll come back around and work on them more in the future. But for now, I think that's that's where we're at. So Jeffrey said, how do you use Saversim to find out what the chalk may be? Uh, well, I mean, the easiest way is our ownership projections. That I would say, you know, for most sports, uh, at least the big f- three, baseball, basketball, and football are going to be 
very, very good. Actually, MMA, uh, we have very good MMA ownership projections too. We did some work on the MMA ownership model this past weekend. Um, and I think those are looking really good as well. Uh, the chalk, I think the easiest way to figure out what the chalk is going to do is look at the ownership projections, right? What's the chalk pitching tonight? Probably Manea and Cortez. And then maybe you see people get to some of these cheaper options here a little bit as well. What are the chalk bats? Uh, it looks like LA, St. Louis, Boston. There's your chalk. Um, so I think that's probably the easiest. I think that's probably the easiest approach. There's other things you can do here. Uh, other ways you can get creative. I think one thing that, you know, if you're interested in looking at like actual lineup constructions, I think building um, like cash builds, right? Uh, maybe even setting a stacking rule and then building a bunch of cash lineups, right? This, this will mimic what players using a traditional optimizer going in and saying, put a five stack in every single lineup and build me 300 lineups, 500 lineups. This will essentially mimic what that does. Um, this can be a pretty good way of like, if you want to dive into individual like lineup constructions a little bit more, but I think the easiest way to get a sense of where the chalk's going to be is to just trust the ownership projections um, because they're, they're pretty solid, especially for, for baseball and um, some of the other major sports. So the reason I say some of the other major sports on some of the other like smaller sports, you know, when we get into things like formula one and NASCAR and esports, even to a lesser extent, um, one of our primary inputs is to our ownership projections for all sports is our, uh, our Sims. Um, and on some of the smaller sports that breaks down a little bit more, I think that's a less effective way of, of measuring ownership sometimes where, you know, it's it's I, just more data points I think would be useful there, which is something we want to add in the future. But um, it game says, "What's your TK name?" I'm ugly, lovely. Mine's Jordan Chand. Has the Saberson logo up there top up top too. So pretty easy. Uh, I didn't realize what I was entering when I originally named my DK profile years ago. So um, maybe change that at some point. But uh, Daniel says I'd reserved entries for a slate because it was filling up, but then I was unable to upload my lineups. It said I had the max amount of lineups already. Any idea what would be the issue? Uh, no, frankly, I am. I don't, was that an error you were getting on Sabersim or on the sites? Um, I'm a little unsure. I've never seen that on our end. I don't think I've ever seen that on the, the sites end either. Um, I know like FanDuel, for example, on smaller sports in particular will limit the number of lineups that you can play at a certain, like for NASCAR, for example, I've run into this. You can only play 250 total entries below $3. So you can't actually max out the five cent and the quarter on FanDuel for NASCAR. You, you can only play 250 unique. So like, that's something that can happen. Um, if this was a Sabersome issue, if this was an error you were getting on Sabersim, I think maybe you might be better off using the report a problem link to report it to our support team. They'll be able to help with a little bit more detailed troubleshooting than I can do on the stream. Um, but um, adjuster says, can you set a max exposure to all teams? Not, uh, not before the build at the moment, but you can generally get, you can generally set these post build and get your exposures exactly the way you want them here. So after you build lineups here, um, if you pull this up here, you can go over to the teams tab and then set, set these exposures here, right? So maybe you don't want more than 15% of any stack. We can start setting 15% max stack exposure and slowly here, um, adjust these until we're, we're happy with that. So, uh, we are planning on adding this so that you can do this before the build because it is just a little bit of an app oversight for now. But the easiest way to do this in the meantime is to do it um, post-build. So, But that is how you do it. So... Um, let's see. A couple other questions here. And then we'll start to wrap up here. Um... But um, Matt said, for late swap, best available versus best on same team. Does the swap tool have knowledge of knowing if the out player is in a stack where best on same team makes that correlation? Uh, for example, Harper Scratch, he's a one-off in a lineup of mine. Does the swap tool know that know this to the point at best on the same team? No, it doesn't. I get what you're saying. So no, there is no like, 
if stacked best available from same team, if not stacked best available. Um, one thing to note there, you know, is like a lot of times that projection difference doesn't end up making a huge difference, right? Like, let's go. Let me get, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Like, um, let's pull the Phillies up. So like, let's say Harper got scratched and he's an outfielder and he's 6,100 and he's used as a one-off in one lineup. And instead it puts in Castellanos as a one-off or Schwarber, right? Like, yeah, yeah, maybe you could have played what, who, maybe you could have played, um, I don't know, some other guy. Harper is 811. What, like, okay, so if you swapped it optimally, maybe you could have instead played Brandon Nimmo would actually be the next best projected hitter there. And like, yeah, I guess you're losing a little bit of value there, but it's not much. Um, so the answer is no. Best available swap best available from same team will swap one offs and stacked players alike from the same team. Um, if you want to, if you are worried about that, I think you'd probably be better off using the late swap and late swap. Um, I don't have a, I don't have entries uh, at the moment, so I can't show it perfectly. But using the late swap, but and then la the late swap only players only lineups with an out player option, you'd probably be better off doing that uh, if you want to kind of make sure that that's perfect, but I would not worry about that so much. So. Um, Carlos said, I hope you guys can put some effort into soccer, especially La Liga and the premier league. Not a lot of projections of soccer out there. Yeah. That's, that's another sport that is kind of firmly on our radar there. Um, it is, it is, uh, it's a sport we're excited about. Um, it's also a, a difficult sport to sim. Um, there are, it's an event-based sport, uh, but one, it's, it's actually kind of, you know, it bears some resemblance to American football where there are so many different things that can happen in any given discrete block of time. It's tough. There's also not really a lot of discrete, like one of the bigger, and this is kind of like a, a tangent, but one of the bigger questions we have to solve when we first start building a model out is what is our, what is our smallest unit of time that we're going to measure and we're going to sim, right? So for example, you know, uh, in baseball, it is, uh, it's an at bat, right? We don't, we don't actually sim per pitch. We sim an at bat. So basically, you know, we don't say, you know, fastball, uh, high and inside for a called strike, right? We say batter comes up to the plate, strikeout, batter comes up to the plate, double, right? Um, for football, it's very easy for American football. It's a play, right? One play with play by play simulations. Basketball is an interesting game where uh, it's consistent, it's constant, right? Um, but because scoring or turnovers or things or fouls or other things happen so often, it's also very easy to say, like, it's play-by-play. -play. Um, hockey, soccer, those kinds of sports can become a lot harder to simulate because there's it's consistent action with rare events. So it is difficult to figure out how to do that, right? Um, so kind of, again, kind of a, a tangent there, but it makes that it makes soccer a difficult sport to not, I don't even want to necessarily say difficult. It makes it kind of an intriguing problem. It makes it an, an interesting simulation problem to solve. So it is on our list. It is something we want to, we want to do in the future because I think there would be a big edge there. Um, it, it, it is a sport where correlation almost certainly is very high. Um, and where average projections almost certainly are very unhelpful. So it, it kind of stacks up as one of those sports that would probably benefit very well from, um, from a simulation. So, but okay, I'm going to go ahead and cap things off here for today there. Thank you to everybody that joined in, asked questions, participated. Um, we talked about all kinds of stuff here today. That was a fun stream. I will be right back here again tomorrow. Same time, same place, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so in the meantime, good luck. Enjoy the 13-game slate here tonight. Uh, and I will see you guys all tomorrow. Take care.